Today, the internet is radically changing how we Filipinos see the world. Now, we're consuming online content. We're creating it, but more importantly, we're sharing it. Founded in 2010, Thoughtful Media is a global multi-channel network that is certified by YouTube and Google and is now in the Philippines. We help content creators optimize their channel for subscriber growth and channel discoverability. We put creators in touch with the right production people, from shoot to edit. With a diverse network of content creators, we can connect you to the right influential friend from different parts of the world. Our worldwide network consists of over 2,200 channels and a catalog of more than 1,000 influencers. We create bubbles, generating over 626 million views and over 1.2 billion minutes watched per month. Using our vast amount of content creators, we bring you only the best talent fit for your campaign. Our reach is local, but our impact is global. What are you waiting for? Be impactful, be effective, be thoughtful. Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar of Thoughtful Philippines. I am Richie Zamora, the network, sorry, the head of network development for Thoughtful Philippines. And we have got uh, a very exciting webinar for you today. We have two special guests, one all the way from Singapore who's joining us, very kind of him. And of course, a popular YouTuber whose focus is on directing and storytelling. And he's gonna be telling us how he's able to, uh, resourceful ways to create content during these trying times. So again, I am from Thoughtful, I'm Richie from Thoughtful Philippines. And Thoughtful Philippines, in case you were wondering, is a multi-channel network. And what we do is we recruit YouTubers to our network and we actually help them build their channels. We help them optimize it for maximum monetization. And so that can be through many ways, whether it's through helping them understand their analytics, helping them with production problems and stuff like that. So in the event that you would like to build your YouTube channel, you can just reach out to any one of us from Thoughtful. We'll leave some names down below and uh, we can talk further. But right now, we want to uh, welcome our very special guest from Singapore. He is the country lead for content partnerships, specifically here in the Philippines, Mr. Pablo Mendoza. Hello, everyone. Hi, Richie. How are you? Hi. I was dreading being side by side with you because it might be obvious who's the better looking one between us. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for 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 joining us today. There are a lot of questions from people that, as our, as an MCN, it's our job, of course, to answer it to the best of our abilities. But with you being uh, within the YouTube ecosystem, we feel that it would be great for our content creators. This is a great opportunity for them to be able to hear it straight from someone of authority like yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I feel honored, actually, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah. So before we get started, I'd like to give them a, a little bit of a background on who you, who exactly you are, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Yeah. Right. So yeah. my name is uh, Pablo. You can read it there. Um, I lead our content partnerships for the Philippines. So I work with um, mostly everyone who uploads content on, on YouTube. So this can be broadcasters, uh, this can be creators, uh, production houses. And my job is to basically help uh, content creators, like many of the ones who are listening to us right now, grow on YouTube and make a living of it uh, when possible. So yeah, looking forward to, to it and All thank right. you for for the so we yeah. prepared a little bit, a little slide for you, about you, if you don't mind. Sure. There we go. So there he is. Pablo is the country lead for a YouTube uh, content partnerships in the Philippines. He works, he works closely with uh, content creators and multi-channel networks in the country and across Southeast Asia uh, to guide them uh, on the best practices and content trends in the YouTube platform. So 
So, yeah. So, uh, he's based in Singapore, but he comes back and forth every now and then to do workshops and stuff like that. So, if he's in the country, that usually means there's a big thing happening uh, over at Google. So, we hope you're you're safe during these times. And thank you again for making time for us. Thank you. I can see I had a haircut. <laughs> that was your, your man bun days. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you want to get started with some questions? Absolutely, yeah. Bring it on. All right. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Okay, so how, how do I get my YouTube channel verified? There we go. Um, okay, uh, I think that kind of replies uh, the question, but there are certain uh, criteria like having more than 100,000 subscribers. Uh, mm -hmm. The channel, you know, the main reason why we have this um, verification badge is to make sure we highlight those uh, channels that are authentic and complete, um, and we avoid impersonation that sometimes happens. So um, as long as that is in place and the content, you know, you uh, as a creator, you follow the community guidelines and all of that, um, you just go to, you can Google that, uh, how to verify the YouTube channel, you will get to a help center in our uh, YouTube help center, you'll find a link. There's an application, you apply, it's very easy. You add your channel, your name and your channel name. Um, and then after a while, uh, our teams verify manually um, and then the badge is, is granted. It can take a bit of time. So I, I assume that uh, maybe those who are asking this question, uh, maybe taking a bit uh, longer than usual. Um, but as you know, this pandemic is also causing some uh, delays in some things. So please, uh, yeah, be, yeah, bear with the uh, with the with the slight delays. So yeah. it's it's funny to think about it that way. That even a a, a a company as huge as Google has been affected to the point that you guys are also scaling down in terms of teams, making it skeletal. Or so is it? No, I would say it's more logistically, right? So we are all working from home, working right? From home. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And there are many people that are maybe um, living with their, their kids and taking care of their kids yeah. while, um, you know, they instead of going to the school. So then it takes a little bit uh, of time right. for everybody. So, yeah, but, it, you know, we, we should be back uh, to normality very soon. Mm -hmm. So it just shows that this pandemic really leveled the playing field for everyone. Everyone is affected, no matter how big or small your company may be. Absolutely. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. How do I decide what niche I want to stick to? Hmm. So I think um, I, I like the fact that it says niche. So the person who asked this probably is thinking about a particular type of content, um, mm -hmm. but it's not sure about um, what type of content inside that content genre. So, and the reason why I highlight this is um, it's it's important to follow your passion. So if you like music, you just do music. If you like to entertain and do comedy, do comedy. Don't do vlogging just because you see a lot of people doing it and, and you think it's it's popular. Uh, and the reason for this is not just a philosophical thing, but is a very practical thing. Um, if you see, you know, if you just look around and see the big creators, um, it, there's a lot of work that takes to, to grow a YouTube channel, a lot of time. So you better um, do this uh, combined with some passion. Uh, if you just do it because uh, a particular content is popular, you, you'll get tired of it. Uh, so then first follow your passion. Then in the niche, then th there, are, there are a couple of strategies. You can look around and see what other creators are doing and find your, your space. Um, and yeah, just try to brainstorm um, out of all the options that are available, um, what is something that resonates better with you? That's one. The second thing is with everything, just test. Test and take some, some risks and see how the audience reacts. Because maybe you know you think something won't work, you try it, and then people start loving it, um, and then you you feed your passion and you continue. So so I would say it's a combination of both these things. All right, I think I, I totally agree with what you said, and something that uh, as an MCN that we try to invoke to our creators is try to be as authentic as you can, because uh, 
authenticity comes off as great content. It just kind of uh, follows through. Absolutely. You need to enjoy the process. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because when you're doing something you love, it doesn't feel like it's work. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. I, that's how I got started with food. <laughs> so anyway, next next question. <clears throat> my lo my low views don't reflect my high subscriber count. What can I do? I've seen some sub, mm -hmm. uh, some channels that have let's say fifteen to twenty thousand, but mm -hmm. for some reason they're the, the views they get is in within, within the hundreds or, or low hundreds. Yeah. So what, what do you think is affecting that? So I think uh, the first thing I would say is there are many possible reasons. Uh, so the best way to go about it in a, in a particular case is to check your analytics. The analytics uh, of your channels will tell you everything that's happening in your channel. In general, to answer this question, um, I think you know there's this this relation uh, between uh, subscribers and views. Uh, they kind of go hand in hand, but it doesn't mean that there, you will have as many subscribers as views. Uh, and this can mean both that the the case that you mentioned, right? So you have more subscribers than views. But in some cases, and I'm sure many people can relate to this, they might have a video that has more views than their current subscribers. And so that's one thing. Over time, if you are consistent with what you do, your audience will grow. Then there's one particular case that is uh, sometimes what happens is you start, I don't know who made this question, but if you started your channel uh, many years ago, maybe you need to, or the audience uh, got renovated and you need to start catering to this new audience or you stopped in the middle. That's something uh, uh, um common case, you create content, you stop in the middle for, for a year, let's say, and you start again. So then you need to make sure your older subscribers know that you are re-uploading content, like uploading content again. Um, there's so many um, potential reasons. What I would say is go to your analytics and check how many out of all your viewership, out of, let's say out of a hundred views, how many views come from users that are subscribed and how many views come from users that are not subscribed. And what you should look at is the trend, if it's going up or going down. So then you will have an idea of whether you're gaining more popularity, more subscribers based on your content or not, and what content drives that more or, or less. And finally, I would say, think about you as a user. I am pretty sure that as a user, you're subscribed to more channels than you actually watch every single day. So you don't watch every single video of every single channel you're subscribed. Um, and also you watch videos from channels you're not subscribed. So consistency will turn these casual viewers into subscribers. And, and I think that that might be it. Usually this gets solved by being consistent in timing, in content type, et cetera, et cetera. I think the big misconception there is that if I have 100,000 viewers, uh, subscribers, I should get 100,000 views, but it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> so that's there's a big disconnect there. So I think it's just like what you said, understanding how the numbers work, how YouTube itself uh, works in order to get a better understanding of your views. Yeah, and, and you know, it's like uh, you can have uh, 50 friends. You don't see all your 50 friends every day, right? Right. But they're still your friends. Um, so then when you need a helping hand or when you have something to share, you can share with, you know, a fraction of them. You know they're there, so eventually you engage with them. Um, right. And you also know maybe another 50 people that are not friends that from casually you talk to, uh, mm -hmm. from time to time and they can become friends as well in the future so so the, i think that's uh that's a good analogy great okay moving on to the next question what are the basics of setting up a brand friendly channel pretty straightforward um <laughs> there's <Wholesome>. um, <laughs> yeah, you can you can google um advertiser friendly content guidelines 
And that's a, we compiled a list of guidelines that make the content usually very ad friendly, uh, brand friendly as it is here. Um, and then, so then you can go through that and that you can read that. What I could add now is think of your channel as a brand as well. So as a brand, you, you, you create a video for you to create a video, it takes you forever, right? So you script it depending on the genre, right? But you script it, you record it, you edit it. Um, then you re-edit, then you re-record, take different takes and until you finally have the video, then um, you have a strategy on how to publish it, when to publish it. There's still a lot of work that goes behind it. So if you do it consistently for six months, that's a lot of work. And that's a brand you want to protect. Now, imagine someone says, hey, collaborate with me. And then this other creator might have content that is violent or that, you know, invites people to be violent. Maybe you don't want to get associated with that, right? So that's the same thing that happens with other brands because your channel is a brand, right? So think of other brands going through the same thing. So they, it's hard that they, it's unlikely that they want to associate with uh, violent content or hateful speech and all of that. So if you, if you don't want it for your channel, uh, it's easier to understand why other channels or other brands want, don't want it either. So that's one. The second thing is sometimes it's also good to reflect and say, you know, if you have a thousand views in a, in a video, some people find it that it's not a lot, but it's a thousand people you're talking to. So it's good to take some time to reflect on that and say, you know, I better focus on the positive aspect of the world or impact positively. And it's kind of associated with brand friendly guidelines. Right. So uh, <clears throat> it's a, basically it's that you want to project something, or the, uh, basically uh, something positive to the world. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, yeah. And Sorry, no, go ahead. You were saying, you were saying. Yeah, so of course then they can, you know, people in the, in the, um, in the audience can look for advertiser um, friendly content guidelines on YouTube and they will find a step by step and all that. Uh, but I think it's more valuable to understand the reason why this is. So it also, they don't need to memorize what it is. It's more that is common sense when you put yourself in the shoes of, of a brand because a channel is a brand as well. Uh, so that that's, but of course we can, we can mention the, the, the guidelines if you want. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you know, I, I, I learned something that I learned from you, from you and uh, the workshops is, especially last year, uh, Google, YouTube uh, had an initiative to make sure that three keywords was the material. They want content creators to create material that are that isn't just entertaining, but empowering and enriching. So that's what we that's that that's what uh, thoughtful that we always disseminate to our content creators as well. Fantastic, and that's easily seen in the creators you manage. That's that's correct. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. So this question gets asked a lot. I'm sure you get asked this a lot as well. In fact, yeah. I want to know the answer to that. <laughs> what is the best <laughs> method to get subscribers? Okay, so let me split my answer into two. Uh, okay. One is I wouldn't focus on what gets you faster to something, in this case, subscribers, what is, but instead, what is the best way? So there are, there are very easy, uh, there are many ways in which you can grow subscribers. And sometimes breaking rules uh, make you get faster anywhere, in this case, subscribers, but might not be useful for you. Um, and so in the long run, you lose the subscribers or, you know, if, for example, if you think that a particular content type is super popular, right? So not breaking any rules. Um, and you go and create content around that. Um, then you may, you may get a lot of subscribers, but that, after six months doing that, you get tired of it and you want to change because that's not really what you like. Then all that you've done in these six months kind of goes to trash, right? So then it doesn't make sense. Um, but I understand the, the spirit of the question. The question is how to grow as fast as I can doing something, you know, uh, logically 
uh, logical. So um, there, there are some things that are basic but are key. And if anyone <laughs> hear me or heard me in other events, I I am a synonym of you know I use a, a word very often that is consistency. Um, you need to be consistent, and that's for everything. So pick a, a topic, create content on it, um, and be consistent in se several aspects. One is schedule. Um, define a schedule. It can be once a week. It can be twice a week. It can be every day. Some creators do it. Um, just make sure you can keep up. Don't go too crazy about it. The second thing is consistency in the voice or the, the brand, right? So the, um, the colors, the thumbnails, the titles, and then consistency in the content. So what, to what topic you, you pick and so on. That's the structure. Then you can add interactivity. Uh, use um, chats if you do live streams or premieres. Use um, com comments back. Um, use a community tab. All of this in the interactivity makes your channel grow faster. Um, recently, we found that um, if you start using stories on YouTube, channels that use stories on YouTube grow if you gr usually grow a thousand uh, subscribers, you grow a thousand eighty subscribers. So initial eighty subscribers just for using stories because they are seen by people that are not following you, and then they get to know you. So there are many strategies for you to grow your audience. I would use uh, I would I would combine all of that as well as your other platforms if you have a following Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, uh, for sure. Okay, uh, great. So basically what you're saying, um, it isn't just getting, the, it's not the quantity, it's, it's you look more at the quality of the subscribers that, that, uh, that, 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 that you look for as well. Because if you churn out quality content, engage mm -hmm. with your uh, subscribers, uh, you, you could in turn build a community and they, they would just really follow and uh, end up finding your channel anyway. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So here we have a question from one of our content creators, Casey Gardner. I have been trying con to consistently upload for the past months, and I can see an increase in engagement dramatically. Indeed, consistency is the key. Sorry, it wasn't a question. It was a comment. So exactly. Yes. Um, um, and I have to say, Casey is not a paid actor. Yeah. <laughs> he is not. <laughs> Next question. I think uh, Jay Miranda has a question, but this is going to be connected to one of our other questions uh, as well. I think it's the next one as well. Uh, next yeah. question, Jay. Sorry. Uh, let's, let's not do Jay Miranda's first. Uh, okay. Let's not okay. do Jay. We have, a, we have a question later that is connected to that, I believe. Okay. okay. So, so, is it necessary to reshape your channel in order to survive in today's current pandemic, I guess what they're asking is: Do they have to change what hmm. what uh, their their strategy, their their theme, in order hmm. to adapt to what's going on? So I would start saying that um, adaptation is key in this um, in this uh, project, right? So if you have a channel, you need to adapt consistently and look around and see what is happening, right? Uh, of course, this pandemic is a bit more drastic, and so it impacts everybody, not only YouTube channels, right? Uh, just open the window, you see that there's no one in the streets. That That's for a reason. So, um, so then, yes, I think some type of content needs to um, change. So for example, travel travelers, you know, so those who do travel bloggers, um, yeah, they, they need to change it a bit. Um, but I wouldn't see it as a limitation, but as an opportunity to find new ways to interact with your audience and to create content. Uh, there, there are endless amount of new formats or, no, I wouldn't say new formats, but um, formats that are more and more popular now because of this uh, situation. It can be interviews over video calls. It can be collaborations in which, uh, you know, your your friend 
records at home, you record at home, then you put it together, you make it look like, like it's um, in the same place. Or uh, even parodies about uh, what it is like to live in this new reality or uh, I recently <laughs> watched a video about um, a party on classes over video call. So there were a bunch of uh, creators that were pretending to be teachers. And then they asked that the, these creators asked the audience to send videos uh, of themselves uh, asking questions to teachers. And so then they, they compile these content sent by their fans um, with questions, and then they pretended to be all in a huge class, video call class, and answer, answering these questions. And that's very innovative. And you know, it, it so this means this situation also opens opportunities to innovate. All right. So exactly what you said. It's about adapting. Uh, as a content creator myself that does food, I do a lot of restaurant reviews. I had to create a series where I'm trying food that is being delivered to my house. And at the same way, I was able to help small businesses uh, market their their products. So yeah, it's all about adapting. Eric Teodoro, thank you very much for your question. That, was, that came from one of our content creators who loves food just like me. <laughs> okay, next question. What are the top platforms to share your videos to get the most engagement and views? I think the answer is all of them. Um, but maybe instead of just stopping there, I would say there's an easy way to share your content. Um, one is to sh just upload a video on, on YouTube and share the link. Well, OK, that's pretty, pretty easy. Um, but I would say that every platform has their its own uh, strengths and its own culture and ways. So, of course, it takes a bit longer, a bit more time and effort. But if you can create content that is that fits every platform's strengths to drive more, more engagement and then traffic to your main video on YouTube, that's going to be more powerful. It's going to develop your brand much better than just sharing uh, assets, right? So uh, you can, and this, you can take it everywhere, right? Because you can take it even back to the moment in which you are recording, thinking already, okay, this is going to be clipped this way to be in this social media, or this style is more for this other social media, or maybe you just create that and separately you produce a clip uh, specifically done, I don't know, a TikTok challenge, you know, so, use the power of platforms to grow your brand. Um, and I think that's the best uh, way to do it. Then of course, each platform might be a better fit for different uh, content types. And that will depend on each person, right? Um, but I would say that, yeah, be smart. Today you have access to so many different platforms with so uh, such a big audience, uh, just, Look, find find the way to leverage all these platforms um, to grow your your brand. All right. So, like what you said, um, each platform has different audiences. So it's just a matter of uh, choosing which one you feel is uh, best fits your niche and max finding a way to maximize it as well. Okay. Great. Great. Next question, please. Here, <clears throat> this is connected to the question of Jay Miranda a while ago. Jay Miranda is also part of the Thoughtful Network, and he exploded on TikTok recently. And after becoming very popular on TikTok, he's now exploring uh, YouTube. And so we're helping him with that. So uh, what is the recommended frequency of, post, of, of posting? Cool. Well, uh, welcome, Jay. Welcome to the family. This <laughs> um, question is, is also, does the YouTube algorithm favor creators who upload frequently? Mm, I don't think there's a, no, I wouldn't say so. I would say um, you need to optimize for uh, watch time, for engagement. Um, and then the idea is that you create content that you're passionate about and that you do it consistently. Now, if you upload every day and after a month you're burnt out, 
then it's not a good idea for you, right? Um, so instead of focusing on what YouTube or what any platform wants or uh, um, incentivizes, I would think more on what me as a creator, what I want, what I can do and optimize based on that. Now, to answer a bit more specifically, um, what's the frequency of posting? Well, of course, if you upload once a month, uh, that's a choice you make, right? Um, you're not going to grow as fast, most likely. Uh, there are chances to grow fast even uploading once a month, but it's likely that you're going to grow slower than if you upload um, once a week, let's say. Um, but then, and the same thing happens if you uh, upload every day. Well, I, I would doubt it. I don't think there's a line between the more you upload or the more frequently you upload, the faster you grow, because also it harms quality, right? Um, so we just take a balance and try to um, to upload frequently, maybe once a month, once a week, maybe twice a week, um, but just keep an eye on the quality and the engagement and making sure you're connecting with your audience. The audience is what is actually, uh, what actually matters here. Um, so pay attention to what they want and what they enjoy and marry that with what you like and what you enjoy. I don't know if that answers the question. I think that, that answers it perfectly. Uh, YouTube needs to be a project of passion. Needs to be a work of it, but if you feel compelled to do it, uh, it's going to reflect in the quality of videos that you make as well. <clears throat> um, I think, am I right, Pablo? Um, this whole algorithm thing, uh, it's not so much that it favors those that post frequently, but the the bottom line is that if you have more content out there, there's a bigger chance for people to discover your videos because you because of their your sheer volume of content. It's not really an algorithm thing. It's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that, that's that's fair. That's a fair uh, comment. Yeah. Um, so of course, if you have a, I mean, it, but it's maybe it's easier to think about it as, as a user. And I think the beauty of it is that most creators are also users. So if you think of yourself as a your user, um, you go to a channel that has one video. Well, it's unlikely that you subscribe, right? Um, it's unlikely that you go to these uh, channel owners' Instagram and, and follow this person and so on. Instead, if you find a channel that has a lot of content in a organized way, consumable, um, has a topic, it's likely that if I connect with that topic, um, I watch more content and then I follow the, con the content in different platforms. So, so it's more of that than just the frequency. At the same time, like I said before, even if I like the content, but you upload once a month, once every two months, sometimes super irregularly, like twice today and then never again until for three weeks. And then, so that also makes me uh, unlikely to subscribe. So the more you follow these, basic but important principles, the, the better it is. It's not so much about uploading every day or you know going crazy about it. It's more about the consistency in being coherent with what you do. Okay, great. Okay, next question, please. Next question, Jan. What are the strongest niches on YouTube? I think that's a good... Uh, Question. So for those that are looking to start a channel, might hmm. uh, hit their passion or hobby? Of course, I'm not going to repeat it. It's a passion thing, right? So don't go to just any type of content. Um, but I think some uh, segments or type of content that have seen a little growth recently are, uh, you know, fitness, um, you know, dancing at home, all these things that drive exercise at home um, and and make it makes it possible for people to to stay healthy um, that has grown a lot uh, recently uh, for obvious reasons right and maybe one easy way to think about it is to again look around or look at yourself what if you changed any pattern consumption pattern uh, so for example in my case uh, now I consume a lot more news content 
right? Um, so, and why? Because of course the pandemic is, is here and you want to keep yourself informed. And then as a consequence of that, I get exposed to a lot of other news content, right? So maybe something I wasn't interested in or so interested in the past, now I get exposed to it and I start to like and consume more news content. So if you think about it and you are maybe passionate about uh, news and journalism, maybe this is a moment, right? So start creating a few videos about uh, COVID, about what happened, what will happen, what experts say and communicate. Um, and that might be your niche, right? Um, the other one is gaming. Of course, gaming is, is booming. Sure been growing for a long time um but even professional athletes uh are starting doing gaming and that's driving a lot of more viewership as well and interest those who maybe didn't like gaming or didn't even know what gaming was started seeing athletes creating gaming content and they follow the athlete and then they see the content and they, they like the content and then they find creators that are experts at creating gaming content and then they transition to oh new audience that is interested in gaming um and of course in the philippines music um <laughs> that, I think that goes without saying um yeah general entertainment um there's there's room for everything honestly it's such a big country as well uh some of you create content in english or so even even bigger uh, bigger potential, um, and YouTube reaches everyone. So yeah, just focus on something you enjoy, and out of that niche, just test, try, risk, take risks, and then you'll find um, yeah what to what to do. All right. Nice. Okay, next question, Jack. Okay, uh, this, uh, there was a rumor that YouTube was going to change its YPP requirements to 5,000 watch hours and 10,000 subs. So once and for all, address that rumor for us, Pablo. Is that true or not? I can tell you something very easily. I get rumors about everything on YouTube every day. 99.9% .9 of them are wrong, like just people making it up. Um, we continually make changes, so that's short, for sure. Mm, about this in particular, I can't comment. Th this is actually the first time I, I see this in particular, but I can tell you so many rumors that every day, uh, <laughs> every day. All right, so as of right now, there is no uh, motion to change the the requirements of YPP. It's still going to be 4,000 watch hours and one th minimum of 1,000 subscribers. All right, great, great to hear. Okay, next. Next. And don't don't be surprised if any of these rumors then become true. <laughs> I don't know. This. Yeah. <laughs> it won't be your fault. It won't be your fault. <laughs> So are content with borrowed material from other sources such as reaction videos and even gaming videos where they do commentary, is that monetizable? Would it fall under fair use? So of course, a fair use is a legal term, right? So um, you would you should check with a, a lawyer in, the, in a particular case. But answering this in general terms, um, yeah, as long as you uh, use content and add a valuable commentary, uh, and a decent modification of the original content. Um, that usually is considered fair use, even if you use it to critique some, you know, the content and so on, for sure. So in this particular question that is about reaction videos, um, yeah, you're, you're basically adding commentary on it. Yeah. Um, and maybe the best way to think about it also is to put yourself in the other side that is you create the content right and somebody else is somebody else uses it uh so you don't want someone to use it just um re-uploading it but if the other person is adding value they're creating with uh what you created in the past and and that's on the one direction and the other direction is more any video you create is a consequence of things you've learned in the past so at some point, you're also taking things from other people, True. teachers, uh, TV, other creators, and then creating your 
video, let's say, right? So of course, there are some degrees. Um, the extreme would be re-uploading, which is ad adding zero value. And then the other extreme is creating a completely new thing. But points in the middle can be fair to use. And then a lawyer will be better equipped to say, okay, this is from this side of the line or this other side of the line. But in general, this in this question, this is usually considered fair use. And in principle, it should be monetizable as long as it follows, of course, the community guidelines and all of that that we all know. Right. Well, there's a follow-up question to that. Uh, what constitutes fair use material? Is it uh, only applicable to U.S. law or here in the Philippines? So, um, as it's clearly stated there, it's legal terms. So, I am I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak on behalf of a lawyer. Um, and law changes uh, across countries, so it's better. So, I would say, unfortunately, I can't you know uh, give a specific answer. Uh, because it changes and is, you know, every, th there's a reason why there are judges, right? Because even though the law is written, there's interpretation, right? Um, so what I can say is check with a lawyer if you make some help. Yes. Um, yeah, but in general terms, uh, yeah, if you modify, and, and I think we, we have a, a link in the help center explaining a few guidelines to understand what fair use would be. And you can also Google it. Uh, it's, yeah, you, you can find a few, kind of like a, um, an idea of what it is. All right, so move. I think Jan wants us to move on already. Uh, will YouTube offer other payment platforms for features such as channel memberships? Here, you might want to discuss a little bit on channel memberships. Sure, sure. So um, I hope everybody's aware of what channel memberships is, but let me just give a brief description of, of, of it. So, um, Channel memberships is a feature that enables or allows users to access to additional perks. Let me define what perks is later. Through the payment of a membership of a monthly fee to the creator, right? So as a user, I uh, join this members club in a channel and then I access, let's say, um, behind the scenes content from a creator, uh, custom emojis, all these perks that are defined by the content creator. So if I'm speaking to an audience of creators, the way you can think about this is um, your users, some of them really want more from you and they will love to have a custom emoji or behind the scenes material or even, I don't know, one-on-one uh, -on -one video calls, if that's something you want to do, or if, you, if you're if you a musician or, or an artist, you want to sell um, your tickets at a discounted price for big, big fans that follow you. Um, so then you can enable channel memberships. Uh, let's say, you know, you can set the price, one, two, three, five, 10, 100 US dollars or any currency, and it applies to every country in the world. Um, and then give that in exchange, right? So that's channel memberships. The currently, what happens is, um, as a user, let's go back. As a user, um, I can only become a member and pay channel memberships using credit cards. So some, I've heard a lot of feedback from from <laughs> you and other creators um, saying, yeah, that. The credit card penetration. There's not a lot of people that use credit cards in in the Philippines, and instead there are other popular payment methods. So we're constantly working to improve this and many other features. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll bring more solutions. Having said so, I think it is a good opportunity to start testing and seeing what works, what doesn't work, and also thinking and create and thinking creatively what can constitute a good perk uh, that adds real value to your audience. Um, and then when pay more payment methods come, then you have that job done ready and you, you tested it for a while. So long story short, it's like having one of those services like Patreon built into your channel. So you don't need to go out outside anymore of YouTube. So there's even a tiering system, am I right? Yes, you can have different tiers and offer different perks yeah. that can be a wide array of things. Yeah. 
So my only advice to those that can, uh, that are el eligible, is just make sure the perks that you give are sustainable on a monthly basis. Because you're going to have some angry members. <laughs> All right. Do we have more questions or do, are we going to start taking from the group? Well, here, why is monetization now off by default? And what determines how YouTube turns uh, monetization on for individual videos? Cool. So um, I think that we need to understand that uh, monetization is, um, uh, is a feature that you need to enable and you are responsible for uh, what you what you create and what you monetize. Um, so now there's a new flow in which you need to categorize uh, or describe your content to make it uh, ad to to show if it is ad friendly or not. This doesn't mean that the platform doesn't allow it. Uh, you can definitely upload content that is I don't know maybe um, about a war or a recent uh, negative. Um, news event, you can definitely upload it. So there's freedom of speech and expression in the platform. We respect that and we value that. Um, but at the same time, you need to understand that uh, advertisers might not choose to, to be against uh, these uh, war-related content, let's say, or airplanes crashing. Um, so even though there's infor informative value, so we keep it in the platform, uh, it might not be valuable for advertisers. And so you want to be smart about that. Um, so that's why there's this new process in which you have to um, to describe the content and, and choose whether it is or it isn't available, um, eligible for monetization. So it's important that you keep up to date with the policies and understand the reasoning behind it as well. Okay, another question from one of our creators, uh, Jeman is what's really the standard for photo display for YouTube videos? I'm assuming he's talking about thumbnails. Uh, some say it should not have text. Some say it's needed. And does it really affect searchability? Okay. I think there are a few psychological studies, not even on YouTube, but um, that if you add a face on a thumbnail, it's usually uh, more clickable. What I would say, and, and that's, in general terms, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, but what I would say is every channel is different. So it would be um, uh, it would be wrong from my side to give a very particular uh, advice on this. What I would say is go to your analytics. You can measure all of this. And you can see uh, what's the click-through rate of your thumbnail. Easy. So click, uh, go to your analytics, sort the videos by the click-through rates in your thumbnails, and you will find both the best performing and the worst performing. So I'm sure you can draw some conclusions from, from that. Um, and then in terms of searchability, you can also search that as well, like in analytics. So all the information is there. I would just check that. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's it. There, we can speak about analytics for a day, um, yeah. There's one a question by uh, a blogger friend of ours, Azrael. Uh, and I noticed too, this is why I'm bringing this up. But um, I receive uh, these generic comments by bots. Is that going to hurt my channel? Should we delete or ban, ban them? These bots are growing every day. As soon as I post a video, within mm -hmm. minutes, great video, want to be friends. Something like, something, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a generic comment. What's the hmm. best way for us to deal with that? Yes, uh, reporting it also. And if you can report the channel as well, uh, we get tons of signals from users and from our systems to identify, let's call it spam in general. Um, and we, we work really hard to keep the platform really clean. There are many, many things that don't even get to either Ever, ever be seen by anyone because our systems are really quick at uh, identifying and removing this type of things. Even content that goes go against our policies and, you know, so, so there's a lot of work there, but of course, help from the community and the creators we want to make out of YouTube a great place. So it's a place for everyone. So if you can 
report that we'll take that and and work on it okay. so one of our creators from uh, down south Papa Lem uh, is asking is doing regular YouTube live streaming say once or twice a week does it help as well in principle it should uh, work as long as you know you make sure you just do an engaging content and so on right um, but it should because it gives you consistency if you say once or twice per week you're already speaking about being consistent with it and that should help um, then of course it's a matter of the content and how you engage with your audience um, but in principle it should be positive yeah and if not uh, I will look into the analytics of the videos and understand what is happening okay another question regarding copyright claims is it detrimental for one's channel should he be should uh, a person be alarmed if they get uh, if they get a claim well I th well the first thing I would say um, you can work with thoughtful. They they uh, they're very good at this. Um, and but in general, <laughs> but in general, yeah. I mean, content. Uh, just be careful. Try not to use uh, content that belongs to someone else and so on. Or come to previous agreements with the owners of the content that you are using. But in principle, the content that gets claimed, that's all right. It shouldn't harm you. I mean, as long as you don't do anything egregious, right? But for a uh, copyright claim, shouldn't be an issue. All right. Pablo, thank you. So just one last message to the creators here in the Philippines. Anything you want to say? I would say um, I am really looking forward to this um, pandemic situation to be over um, so that I can go back to the Philippines. Um, as you said at the beginning, I'm in Singapore. Uh, but I used to go very often to, to the Philippines almost once a month. And it's been a while already. So I miss meeting you guys and creators and the energy that is there and the creativity. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And thank you, everyone. Hope it was useful. Um, yeah, and then hope everybody is uh, safe and take care of their families. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you so much. Looking thank forward you. Having more activities with you in the future, hopefully. Absolutely, hopefully. All right, thank you guys. To, to everyone that that participated, if you if your uh, question wasn't answered, you can just send a uh, message to me and uh, any of your NDOs, and we can help you out any way that we can. All right. So next, it's all. guys. One of my favorite YouTubers. He's gonna be doing a uh, a break that sample for us. No, I'm just kidding. I know he's watching, waiting. <laughs> he's waiting backstage. <laughs> he's gonna kill me for that. No, I'm joking. But uh, si direct Bani Logroña is here, and he's gonna be sharing with us some of his tips on how to create content during this. Uh, during this, how do you say it, trying times. All right. C come on in, Derek. Hey, hey what's up? <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear loud and clear, loud and clear. All right. Awesome. Okay. So, just another direct, um, I have a little bit of a, I know, a slide that I'd like to show before you, before you start. Okay. Can you <laughs> hear that? I just want to show the people who you are <clears throat> do we have that okay that pogi naman itong guy na tanga so that guy is a professional writer and film director based in the philippines he is also a youtube content creator that gained fame with his original short films with local celebrities and fellow content creator friends like bani also likes to vlog about his work and family life so uh, Drek, you have been still cons consistent during uh, during this uh, pandemic. In fact, you even found a way to start yet another channel. <laughs> yeah. So while other people are struggling to find content, you started a new channel because you've got so much of these creative juices that you need to, to let out. So uh, like I, I think I mentioned to you, 
tomorrow is usually uh, Saturdays is usually horror night in uh, the Zamora household, and we're gonna be watching your your horror video tomorrow night. So oh, great! <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I, I can't wait to um, see your reaction. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll make a reaction video if you don't mind. <laughs> All right, guys. Without further ado, I'd like to share the screen with Derek Bani. He's gonna be uh, doing his uh, presentation now on how to uh, on resourceful ways of, of creating content. All yours, Derek. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Sir Richie. Uh, what's up, everybody? This is my uh, first ever um, seminar thing. Uh, even my first ever live stream, I've never like live streamed before. So wish me luck. I hope um, you guys will learn something from this that I give value to to you guys. Um, and hopefully my internet connection stays stable too, because you know Philippine internet. But if anything does cut off, just uh, you know, just let me know in the live chat box um, if you want me to repeat anything, because that's how I'm gonna know what you guys are thinking and if what I'm saying is clear enough. Because uh, you can see me, but I can't see you. So, um, uh, in fact, if if that's clear to you guys, type in yes, sir, in the in the chat right now, so I know that people are listening. Okay, so <laughs> let's go to the next slide. So, like uh, Sir Richie said, um, I'm going to be talking about resourceful ways of creating content, uh, ways to continue working on our channels despite the crazy times that we're living in. Um, while we're all living under quarantine, because I know that this has been like a struggle and a challenge for a lot of creators, um, especially people with like travel channels, like uh, Pablo mentioned earlier, and other channels that require outside activity. Um, and you know, even my own channel, it's a filmmaking channel, and you know, I want to work with other people all the time. So I've had this struggle as well. So that's why I decided to go with this topic. Um, and share with you guys my experience with it so far, uh, with making videos under quarantine as a YouTuber. And I, I know we're technically allowed to leave the house now, you know, since June 1st, uh, for those of us living in Manila, but you know, the virus is still out there. Uh, so it's, it's still better to stay at home and make your videos at home in my opinion. So, um, uh, before we begin, <laughs> I just want to let you guys know a little bit more about where I'm coming from. You know, I'm not a, like a big YouTuber. I'm just, I just have my own, you know, little channel. So I don't want to come off as someone who thinks, you know, he knows everything. And I, I don't want you guys to expect that uh, this webinar will instantly solve all your problems uh, that you're experiencing with your channel. All I know is like what I've experienced so far um, with my own journey, uh, the system that has been working for me and the mindset that, um, that makes me keep creating throughout these months and potentially throughout the rest of the year if this quarantine continues, which it looks like it will. So um, so that's how I'm gonna share with you guys my experiences and hopefully by listening to what I have to say, uh, it will help you help yourself. It will help you help yourself um, to get to where you wanna be with your channel. All right, so uh, with that being said, I wanna show you guys uh, how my channel has been doing first like the journey of it. So here was my output um, of content on my channel right before the pandemic hit the world, like from December 2019 until March. You guys remember 2019? That was such a good year. I missed 2019. <laughs> but as you can see, I only made like five videos in those four months. So very, very low output, unfortunately. Um, I was just a little unmotivated, I guess. At this time, I had just hit like 100,000 subscribers. Uh, but from there, I didn't know like where I wanted to take my channel yet and how I wanted to improve it. So I guess um, that's why the amount of videos that I made were so low. Um, but anyways, that's that. Um, but then when the quarantine started, uh, this is how much I have uploaded so far under quarantine. Um, nine videos and counting. And four of them are like short films uh, or documentaries, which require a lot of time and effort for me to shoot and edit. Um, then it does a regular video. So uh, that's why they get their own posters right there. You know, um, it's a big deal for me when I upload them. But anyways, that's, that's so, so that's like twice the amount of the videos that I made um, 
under quarantine compared to what I made before. So that's pretty good, right? But um, but like uh, Sir Richie mentioned earlier, that still doesn't take into account the my second channel that I made. So I made 14 videos uh, on that channel so far. Um, and then at the same time, I'm also making uh, corporate videos, my main, my main job. So, um, uh, so yeah, like uh, the real count is actually 43, uh, videos under quarantine, whereas I only made five, uh, in the four months before that. So, um, and, and also like in terms of consistency, the videos in my channel, uh, have been more consistent now, not just in terms of how much I've been uploading, but also like, um, like, I'm following my niche of filmmaking now, as opposed to before. I just like I just kind of uploaded whatever, like whatever kind of vlog I could shoot, and I just uh, I just uploaded whenever as well. So, um, so you could say like the quarantine kind of like saved my channel, like kind of revived it, made it more active again. Uh, if you if you uh, if you analyze like what kind of journey I've been I've been in so far, so. Uh, so yeah, that's where I'm coming from, uh, and that's uh, the journey that I'm gonna talk about today. Like of how I was so unmotivated to create before the pandemic, but then now in the current situation that we're in, all of a sudden I'm doing so much more creating than the period before that. So um, uh, and then I'm gonna explain how you can do it as well. Um, and to do that, I think we have to start by addressing. Uh, your mindset, our mindsets, and your beliefs about creating. Um, I think that we have to start there because in order to be able to be a creator in such uh, difficult circumstances right now, uh, we need to have a good enough reason to create, right? Like, um, why should we keep creating content when the world right now, like, it seems so chaotic, right? Like, we're so limited with what we can do. Um, maybe you're having financial problems. Uh, because you can't go to work and to make videos right now, it seems like so unimportant compared to those things that are happening right now, right? Like, I think for the most part, that is what is in the minds of people who have been struggling to uh, to make videos in the past few months. Um, like, it, it's a struggle to find the focus and the purpose in making videos because um, maybe you, you don't think that making videos is really that important right now. So, and, and maybe you're right, you know, like, I, I don't know the exact situation that everyone is in, but um, but still, I want you guys to consider the next few things I'm going to say. So, um, so yeah, why create content? Why make videos when there are more important things that are happening right now? Um, so, I want to give I want to give a few reasons why, uh, in my opinion, it actually is important uh, to be making videos right now. Um, if you're thinking that we are in an unfavorable situation to be making videos, I'm going to try to explain how actually we're, we're, we are in a favorable position, we're in a favorable situation. And uh, I came up with three reasons uh, to support that. I'm going to go from, and I'm going to go from what I think is the least important to the most important. So the first reason, uh, this is more for if you care about, you know, the money aspect or the getting views aspect of YouTube which, you know, we all care about. Uh, and that is right now our videos are more likely to be seen because, uh, you know, everyone is at home for the most part. Um, it, yeah, it is GCQ now. People can go out, but still, you know, the older people and the people under 18, they still have to stay at home. And as creators of content um, that can be accessed at home, uh, if we look at it that way, right now is actually a really good time to be making videos, right? Like the situation is in our, is in our favor because uh, our, our audience, they have less options to choose from uh, to entertain themselves or to inform themselves or enrich themselves, uh, as opposed to if we weren't under quarantine. If we were, if we were not under quarantine, they have the option of going outside, um, watching a movie, hanging out with their friends, partying. But right now, they don't have those options. They can only do so much, um, and one of which is to watch our videos. Because at home, what can you do? You can only watch Netflix, uh, play games. Watch ABS. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, the dark humor there. But uh, yeah, they can only they can only do so many things while they're stuck at home. 
Um, so our videos are more likely to be seen right now. Uh, it's easier to get people's attention. It's easier to be discovered from that perspective. And uh, it's easier to grow our channels and potentially, um, you know, make a like grow our business on YouTube. So we should we should take advantage of the current situation. So, um, so that's the first reason. And um, not seeing any questions so far. So uh, let's continue. If you get so, like I said, if you guys have any questions, just uh, type it down. Uh, okay. So second reason why I think you should be making videos right now is that the limitations that we're experiencing um, under quarantine, it can actually, we can actually use that, that those limitations uh, to make us more creative, um, to inspire more creativity and uh, to make our videos better, more unique, more original. Uh, and this might be a difficult concept to grasp um, if you've never heard of this before, but uh, this can be a really huge, like, game changer for you once you can understand this because i know it seems like it should be the opposite right like limitations should prevent us from being creative because you know it's limiting us but um but actually that's not the case like from my experience and from my perspective uh that it's actually the opposite limitations actually uh can make us more creative so uh so going back and talk about my journey again um as an example, like I, I always wanted to make like lots of short films on my YouTube channel. Like I wanted that to be the main thing instead of uh, the vlogs that that was like my main content before. Um, but for some reason, I had such a hard time making short films. Like my process was really slow, even though uh, I have so many resources before the quarantine, like and so many ideas. But I would often procrastinate on making these short films because, um, uh, and back then I didn't know why, but now now I know that it's because like I had no limitations for myself. Uh, I, I didn't put any limitations on myself with the kind of short films that I wanted to do. Like I was giving myself too much freedom, too many choices, if that makes sense. And um, so that that that's called decision paralysis. Like if if you have like too many choices like sometimes you end up not making any choice at all you know like so like for me like I had so many friends who are great actors who I could ask to you know make the short film with me uh, so many locations to choose from so many stories to tell uh, so many people who I could ask to be part of the team um, but yeah because of uh, that many choices I ended up not making any choices at all most of the time which is why like I couldn't make I didn't make as many short films before. Like there, there were so many paths that I could take that I ended up like not taking any path at all. And this is not just a problem for creative people, you know, um, uh, j just people in general. Like maybe you're relating to this as well. Like for me, when I turn on Netflix, like there's just way too many movies and shows that I can watch. And most of the time I just turn it off because I can't, I can't decide. There's like so many, so many things you can choose from. So that's, that's decision paralysis. Um, that sometimes if we have too many choices, we end up getting overwhelmed and procrastinate and uh, even end up not making any choice at all sometimes. And uh, so that was out what I was going through um, before the quarantine. Um, I was paralyzed with like the unlimited choices for what I could make. So either I made those choices really slowly or not at all, you know, but, um, but now uh, like, like I showed you guys earlier with the quarantine, the limitations have been forced upon me. It's forced upon us this time. Like we're not allowed to go outside. Uh, I can only shoot things inside my house. Um, and I'm supposed to distance myself from other people. So I can't work with anyone else and people can't physically help me out behind the camera, except for my wife. So, you know, we're, we're going to have to do everything ourselves. So the limitations are imposed on us or forced upon us by this quarantine. And that's going to make us uh, think more creatively uh, on using our limited resources more creatively. And uh, that's what has forced me to uh, make my content in uh, in these past few months. So currently, I've 
released two short films so far, like and and two documentaries. Um, but actually, like I'm set to make three, four, three to four short films every month from here on out, like because of this uh, mindset and the system that I've set in place for this. So I'm coming out with a new one next next week, actually, um, and the week after that, and <laughs> so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, from from my from my story, I hope that you can see like the power of limitations and how it can actually make us more productive and creative if you think of it in that way, instead of as something that will limit you. Instead, it's something that you know can motivate and empower you, inspire your inspiration or inspire your creativity. Um, instead of something that's holding you back, uh, it can be something that can make you, um, can force you to make cool videos on your channel again. So. Um, well, let's take a let's take a look at some of these videos that I made. Uh, here's one of the short films that I made as an example. Um, it's a science fiction one, and on this short film, uh, I wanted to tell a story with multiple characters, like, um, like yeah, multiple characters. But the problem was, like I said, like I could only use myself as an actor under quarantine. Um, my wife doesn't, you know, really want to act, so she couldn't be the other character. So in order to solve this problem of just using myself as an actor, uh, I looked around my house and I, I wanted to see what can help me portray multiple characters. And then I looked at my phone and um, and then I remembered like Snapchat. You guys, you guys know the, the app Snapchat. Uh, they have these filters that can make a person look uh, younger or older. So with that, I was able to come up with a story where um, I can turn myself into three different characters like so uh you can see in the poster there's a character there's a younger version of me uh a version of me who's uh me in the present right now and then a version of me who's older and so uh this was this idea was all because of the limitation of quarantine uh, it forced me to think of a creative way to use the resources that i have and so uh yeah it was kind of a challenging process making this one because um, I had to use my laptop's webcam uh, to use the Snapchat filters. And as you can see, it's not very good quality. Um, it's really low frame rate, but I was able to make it work. And uh, and now when I do have resources in the future, like at least I know how to do this process now of making me, making a actor younger or older. But it was, yeah, it was because of the limitation of the quarantine of having only one actor to work with myself. It was because of that, that I was able to come up with uh, this creative solution of using Snapchat to create more characters. And if it weren't for the quarantine, like maybe I would have never thought of that. Like, so that's a direct example of how limitations can force us to be more creative. So um, moving on to my other, uh, other short film. Uh, this one, it's, it's a short horror story. Uh, so I had never thought of my condo, my house, to be a location for a horror film, you know? Like, it's it's not a particularly scary house. It actually looks kind of generic and boring. It's a DMCI house, you know, so they all look the same. And if I wanted to make a scary movie uh, before the pandemic, before these limitations, I would have probably spent, like, so much time uh, location scouting for a different house, something that's really, really scary. Uh, but once again, with the circumstances right now, like I had no choice. I just had to use my own house. Uh, this house had to be the location if I wanted to make a horror film. So uh, I just had to work with it, use lighting and angles and composition to make it look as scary as possible. So on this slide, you can see like some of the uh, screenshots of that short film. Uh, and I guess it turned out pretty effective, like because there's been lots of feedback from people who say that you know, it was a scary short film, and uh, even myself, I don't want to be alone in the in the house anymore after making this. So I got to Yeah, yeah. It looks like, <laughs> but yeah. Again, this this was just all about trying to maximize my resources as much as possible. Um, and just like my other short film with the Snapchat filters, uh, for this one. Uh, for the other one, the horror film, once again, I incorporated uh, um, the app technology into the story as well. 
Like I used Instagram filters for this one. So, so there are so many like free apps on your phone that you can, that can help you make your videos uh, and serve or serve as a topic for your videos. Uh, so that might be something that you want to look into if you're having trouble coming up with content uh, for your channel right now. Just explore like what apps you can use or, or talk about in your future videos. Um, but yeah, if, if it weren't for the quarantine, I doubt like that I would have made this horror short film. Because like I said, I never thought of my own house as haunted before, except for when the limitations of quarantine forced me to think of it that way. So um, the whole point of this is basically just to erase that misconception that just because we're limited with what we can do, um, then we're not able to make good videos or videos at all. When in reality, limitations are the very thing that is going to inspire creativity within us um, as artists or as a content creator. And you can look at, you can look all throughout history, um, in the history of art that this is true as well. Um, like uh, artists, when they were struggling the most, when they were limited the most, that's usually when they made their best art. And you can look at other YouTubers right now, like, uh, and see that this is true for them as well. Like I have a lot of YouTuber friends who are also thriving right now because of the inspiration that this quarantine is giving them, the limitations of the quarantine. So if you have that mindset that limitations are not obstacles, but opportunities, then you're going to be able to uh, get through your creative block if, if, you have, if you have one. Okay, so I'm just going to scrub through the chat really quick. If there's any questions. Uh, creator burnout. How do we change niches during burnout? Um, well, so I, like I said, like I can only speak on my experience. If you're burnt out, um, then you just gotta take a break. Because uh, if you're burnt out, then you're, you're you, you don't have the creative creativity within you. Um, to do your best work. If you're gonna just like force yourself to keep making uh, videos, then uh, it's, it's not gonna be as good as if you take a break first um, before you start again. Uh, but as for how to change niches uh, during burnout, well, I don't know about during burnout, but with changing niches, I, I've, if you look at my channel, like I've changed niches so many times. Um, and you know, I eventually, like I, I got to the hundred thousand. So like, like a lot of people, and I will tell you later that it, it's much better to stick to your niche, but if you really don't like your niche anymore, if it's like not something that inspires you anymore, then, uh, then that's when I would say that, um, it, the best option is to change your niche. Like that happened with me. My channel started out as a, uh, break dance, break dancing channel. But as I grew older and, you know, I got tired more, I'm less athletic now than how I was years back. Um, it, it, it wasn't as fun for me anymore to make videos about breakdancing uh, because it just got a lot harder. So I changed niches to, um, to vlogging and then eventually to my niche right now, which is filmmaking. So uh, any more questions? I think that's All right. Let's move on. Okay, so my last point, um, the last reason why you should be making content during quarantine and what I think is the most important reason is actually pretty simple, but it's something that I think a lot of people forget and even content creators themselves forget sometimes. And it's that uh, us content creators have a really important job of either entertaining people or educating them uh, inspiring them, motivating them, informing uh, one, or, one or more of those things, right? Like, um, and right now with how the world is, it seems that things are falling apart. Uh, no one really knows what's happening or where we're going to end up in the next few months or even next week. Uh, like every time I wake up, there seems to be like some new problem that's happening. Um, so with how so many people are feeling down and hopeless with everything that's happening in the world right now. I think that our job as content creators is more important than ever. Um, we have to give hope to our audience. Uh, 
those who are feeling hopeless, we got to continue spreading that positivity and keeping people informed with our knowledge and wisdom. Or if you feel that uh, that's like too big of a responsibility, then, you know, just make videos to make people feel like they're not alone. Uh, share like the emotions you're feeling, share your thoughts, share your feelings. And chances are that other people are thinking and feeling the same way as you. And through a simple video like that of just sharing how you feel, you're making people, you're making other people feel like they're not alone and giving them, giving them a reason uh, to feel a little bit better uh, than they are. So yeah, those are the three reasons, the three mentalities that you need to have, I think, if um, you wanna continue making content under these difficult times, or at least uh, what I, what is in my mind um, when I'm making videos, uh, that we have an opportunity to impact more people with our videos uh, because many of them are staying at home, that we have an opportunity to be more creative and unique with our videos because the limitations of quarantine, uh, it shouldn't hinder us, but inspire us. And we have an opportunity to really add value to people's lives right now, either through entertainment or education or empathy. Uh, three things that people really need right now, given the current situation that the world is in. So, um, and I think that by thinking about these reasons, these three reasons, and really putting yourself into these mindsets, um, and really believing in them, then, you know, you should be good to go, uh, good with making content. Um, but with that being said, like, I do have some more practical advice and reminders uh, that you guys might find useful for making content that I'm going to share next but first um let's uh, let's let's see if there's more questions once again what type of videos in youtube catches your attention during this pandemic so uh pablo mentioned this earlier like exercise videos are getting really popular um and gaming videos gaming <laughs> gamers aren't affected at all by the the pandemic because you know they they stay indoors anyways so uh, they're really thriving with uh, what's happening right now. Uh, so usually the, those are the things that um, are catching my attention um, on YouTube because that's that's what's populating my, uh, what do you call that? My explore feed, my discover, discover feed right now. Um, Askia asks, what advice can you give for Aspiring filmmakers who are starting to make films through their own limited resources. Like I said, I, like I create short films using iPhone. Um, yeah, so like I said, use that limitation that you have to um, inspire you to be more creative. Um, th th there's been lots of uh, short, not even short films, but like full on feature full length films that have been made with the iPhone, you know, so that shouldn't be something that hinders you at all because it's been, it's already been proven that you can make uh, a film using just your phone. So, um, so yeah, my advice to you is just to, um, to apply what I mentioned earlier about the limitations. It shouldn't be something that will hinder you, but actually inspire you. Figure out a creative way uh, around the obstacle. Uh, there was a quote that I put on my slide earlier. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. So um, if you just uh, meditate on that and apply that into your craft, then that should help you uh, make films if that's what something that you want to do. All right, so additional advice for uh, making, for doing, for uh, creating, re for using your resources uh, is to stay in your niche. Um, or niche, as <laughs> as I just learned, is the proper way to say it uh, earlier. I know it can be tempting to like start making videos unrelated to your niche, uh, especially when you're in a niche that's really affected by this pandemic. Like, uh, for example, if uh, like yeah, if you're a travel channel or a channel that like reviews restaurants like uh, Surichi or something like that, um, but if you all of a sudden start going off topic of, of that niche, um, then that's just going to confuse your audience, right? Like, um, uh, if you like, like make a gaming video all of a sudden, or like a fitness video, um, 
those are really popular right now, but you can't just switch to that type of content unless you can do it in a way that is like still relevant to your niche. Uh, and, th and that is possible, if, or once again, if you be creative about it. Because, uh, you know, your subscribers, they subscribe to you for a specific need. For And if all of a sudden you're giving them something else, then uh, they might not be interested in that. So, you know, just be as creative as you can. Think about what value you are really providing to your viewers. Because, uh, you know, niches, they, they, they put a label on you. Like if you're a travel niche, so you're a travel channel. But there are many types of travel channels, right? Like... Like um, there, there's travel channels that are informative. Um, that's more about reviewing the places that you visit and like providing your audience with information about that place. So if you're that kind of travel channel, like an informative travel channel, think about how you can still be informative about traveling while you're at home. Like you can do something like re revisiting your old videos that you made and like, so like make like a sequel of those old videos that you had um, because the, like there might be some new information that you uh, were missing from that first video that you did. So so that's one idea that you can make uh, lots of videos from just like make sequels of your old travel videos and revisit those old videos. Um, another idea if you're an informative travel channel uh, is since a lot of places like amusement amusement parks, hotels, museums, uh, they have like these virtual tours on their websites. So maybe you can make videos about experiencing those virtual tours and like reviewing your experience with them. I think that would be like really informative. So it's still like, it still fits uh, the content in your channel if you do that. Uh, or instead, instead of like, oh, oh I'm missing one slide. Uh, or instead of like traveling uh, to a different place, maybe like, you can like travel through through time. Like, um, like maybe there's a place that you visited before that's uh, that has a lot of old footage of that place. Like for example, there's a lot of old footage of Manila. Um, so if you watch that old footage, you can see how the Pasig River was back then, how Intramuros was back then, like when when how it was a hundred years ago. Uh, the universities. Uh, City Hall, so you can show that to your audience, and then you can comment how much um, those things have changed, that those places have changed. So, watching old footage is like you know traveling; st it's still traveling, but instead of uh, to a different place, it's traveling to the past uh, and exploring the rich history of a place. So, in that way, you're still making an informative travel video, technically, uh, but instead of instead of space, you're traveling through time. So, that's another example. Um, but on the, on the other hand, if you're a travel channel, that's like all about, um, the experience of the travel rather than something informative, um, then you should be thinking of creative ways to make videos about experiencing, uh, those new cultures and new things that, uh, you experience when you're traveling. Think of ways to, of how your audience can experience, experience that when you're at home. Like maybe you can show your audience, uh, something like you're learning a uh, tribal dance at home from a tribe that you've never heard of before, or like try cooking a dish from a different culture um, or like learning a different language. So, so yeah, there's like so many ways that you can be creative with that, right? Like you can still keep making videos uh, even though you can't travel, but still like providing that experience for your viewers. And then uh, there's more like personality based travel channels, right? Like, um, Maybe people like watching you uh, because you ex you like exploring new places, new things. So maybe um, you can do that just at your house as well. Like just be a bit more curious about um, places in your house that you've never been curious about before, uh, and just make that entertaining that way. Like um, like maybe like exploring your your closet. Um, and then you find a shirt that you haven't worn for like 10 years and you get all emotional and nostalgic and you tell a story about the time you wore that shirt uh, when you traveled to this particular place. So, you know, stuff like that. You can do uh, stuff like that if you have a travel channel that's like more about highlighting your personality. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think your audience would 
like still find that kind of stuff to be relevant. Uh, and then, uh, or like, of course, you can just do a sit down, a sit down video storytelling of a time that you travel to a place, but you haven't vlogged about it yet. So that, that's another idea that you can do. And then, of course, there's the like cinematic uh, travel channels as well. Um, so for that, I mean, the best thing I think is just to make tutorials about the techniques that you use to make your cinematic videos. Because like, if people are watching you for how nice and beautiful your videos are, then chances are they're probably interested in your process as well. Um, they're interested in your in the craft that you that you do. So while you're unable to travel for now, you can just show them behind the scenes of your process. I think that would be uh, something that's really interesting for your for your viewers. So um, so yeah, those are just some ideas for the people with travel channels who are watching. Like the main takeaway here is to just like really figure out uh, what value people are subscribed to you for more so than just what your niche is. Um, there's like a sub or neat niche, sorry. There's like a sub niche um, in addition to what your main niche is. Uh, uh, so, and just like keep providing them with that value uh, with as much creativity as you can. So, and the, of course, like I, I provided like travel, like examples for travel channels, but uh, I think you can apply that to any category as well. So uh, moving on. All right, so uh, my other piece of advice is to just, you, you should keep your content relevant by uh, deriving them from current trends. Um, now that's not to say like make content based on trends just because they're gonna be popular, just because they're trendy, uh, but you should do it in an authentic way, like something that's still relevant and authentic to your channel. So like an example, a couple of weeks ago, there is this, uh, Filipino gamer who will not be named for um, just just so just because uh, he made <laughs> he made the creative industry like in the Philippines he, he made them really angry um, uh, some of you might know this story uh, and it was because he was offering 200 pesos to have his uh, gaming videos edited and so a lot of people got really angry at him um, because the job because you know, obviously that job offer, 200 pesos per video, that's that's way too low. And so this issue became like a became a huge trend for a few days. Uh, a lot of a lot of um, vloggers and filmmaking Filipino channels, uh, they made a lot of reaction videos on this, um, where they uh, got really mad at this particular Filipino gamer and uh, just like really made fun of him um, and his job offer. So me, I decided to react to this guy's, you know, job offer as well, because, you know, editing is a part of filmmaking as well. So it's, it still sort of fits with my niche, you know? So, um, but I didn't want to do it in an angry way, like how everyone else was doing it, because um, it would be inauthentic for me to do that, you know, like, People, my audience knows me like as as a passionate person, but also like as a calm person, like like how I am right now delivering this <laughs> this webinar, right? So it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be authentic if I got angry with him as well. Um, so I, I tried approaching the issue in a more logical way, uh, a way that's more authentic with me, um, a, a more calm and uh, collected way. So. Um, so yeah, because it was a timely and relevant video, um, and at the same time, I I approached it in a unique way, a, a, a way that was unique to myself. Uh, that video is actually like one of my most viewed quarantine videos right now, like out of all the videos I made uh, during quarantine. So as you can see, like 1,700 people subscribed to me because of that video. Uh, and that's because it has such a big impact on a lot of people who watched it. You know, like uh, four thousand watch hours. So, if if I made a new channel and I posted this on that new channel, like I would have gotten monetized right away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can see here the curve of the video. It's it's not flat, just like the country's curve, unfortunately. Um, but here are some comments uh, from the people who watched it, just so you guys can see the impact of making a video that's about something trending and is at the same time 
uh, relevant to your niche and you approach it in an authentic way. So this person uh, shed, said that she started to cry. Like <laughs> all I did was talk about proper pricing for freelance filmmakers in that video. Like if there was one video in my channel that I didn't expect that people would cry on, it would be this, it would be this video, you know, but uh, apparently it made her cry. So did the comment uh, below that. Um, and here's a few more uh, reactions to my video. So yeah, they're saying it's the best response toward that issue just because like it was, it, I approached it in a, in a way that was different from the others. This is the best and most simple response, best response toward the issue. Um, so yeah, um, and even, oh, here's another comment. Uh, I love this video. Instead of focusing on the hate, uh, you focused on a more serious topic, which is uh, fair pricing for freelancers. So yeah, that, that pretty much encapsulates like what I was trying to, um, what was my goal with that video, uh, which is to not focus on the hate like how, what, how the other reactions were doing. And even the, even the gamer in question, uh, he, he messaged me like personally and told me that the video was really helpful to him. So yeah, it just shows you like the power of, um, of making a video that is related to current trends, whatever the current trends are. Um, the best way to make a video about them is to translate them in an honest way, a way that's honest to you, a way that's authentic to your channel. And if you do that, I think uh, it can have a really big impact in your audience, um, as you can see. So so that's, there you go. And last thing is just, you know, just remember to have fun. Don't give up. Um, and remember the three major reasons that I told earlier about why you should be making videos during quarantine, because it's an opportunity to impact people um, to impact more people with their videos because many of them are staying at home. Uh, it's an opportunity to be more creative and unique with your videos because the limitations that are forced upon you, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't restrict you, your creativity, but actually inspire your creativity. And, uh, it's an opportunity to really add value to people's lives right now, given the current situation the world is in. So, um, there you go. I hope that there was something in what I said um, that you guys found helpful. If you've been having trouble creating content for the past few months, and if it was, then if it was helpful, then let me know by messaging me uh, on any of these accounts so that I I can improve the way I do these lectures. Because like I said, this is my first one. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. Uh, let me see if there's any more questions. Wait, uh, Sir Richie, I can't hear you. There you go. There you go. There you go. What if your viewers, your followers, you have something like to do a travel vlog, but your channel is about singing and dancing? Some say we need to connect to our followers. Do we need to accept their request, even if our channel is not about travel? Um, yeah, definitely listening to your audience is, uh, is like a good move, right? Like, um, those are the people who subscribe to you and, um, give you the views, but of course you still gotta have to balance that with what you want to do with your channel as well. But for, right. um, that particular question, um, like you can apply what I mentioned earlier, like, uh, if it's something like um your viewer wanting you to do a travel vlog but your channel is about singing or dancing then maybe you can make a travel vlog that still incorporates that singing and dancing like it doesn't have to be a like uh j just a travel vlog but something that still is relevant to your channel you can you can look at it as a actually you can actually look at it as a challenge yeah yeah uh, you can make fun with it, like uh, accepting challenges for my subscribers or something like that. That type of uh, content. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, Miss Karen Costillo, I always get anxious and stuttered whenever I film. Any advice? Uh, I'm the same way, and I, I still am. <laughs> so you you just have to keep doing it. Like I've 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 been vlogging since um, 
when have I been vlogging? I've been vlogging since high school, technically, like even before YouTube, <laughs> even before YouTube started. And like, even now I, I'm still like, I still get anxious when I, um, when I make videos, but um, if you love it enough and have a purpose for it that you believe in enough, then you're going to get past that. And event I, I have improved, but I still have that problem. Um, but yeah, eventually, if you keep doing it, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna improve and uh, overcome it as well, better than uh, I have. <laughs> Derek, I gotta say that uh, I, uh, given that I've been watching when I watch your videos, I wouldn't think that you have a problem talking. I always tell that, <laughs> to that he's so quiet when we're together. So if you guys have, don't know Derek, if you've never seen, he's so quiet, and then when you watch him in his videos, he looks like a completely different person. <laughs> because I'm <unbelievable. laughs> direct a lot of uh, a lot of our content creators are, I'm sure are very interested in doing collabs with you. Are you open to that? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so yeah, for collabs, like you, um, like just just think about like how uh, you can add value. Um, how you guys can uh, what do you call that? Like give each other value. So. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't have to always be about like, um, we're collabing because, uh, we're gonna like give each other subscribers, but like, um, think about the content as well. Like right. if you're gonna collab with a particular person, like what kind of value are you giving their channel or their brand or that particular YouTuber? So, uh, yeah, definitely. If you, um, if you have a really cool idea that I think can be, uh, that my audience will find really cool as well, then uh, go ahead and just message me about it. I think it's, it, it would be best to, uh, like that, what, like what you said, to come up with a solid plan already of what they have in mind, as yeah, opposed yeah. to being direct, let's go out, but when you get there, yeah, expecting, yeah. You know, expecting that I'm going to make something work or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, we have another question, Direct. Who among the famous mainstream YouTubers do you subscribe to and why? <laughs> Um, well, I, if I, oh, who among the famous mainstream? Um, so actually, I don't um, watch mainstream stuff that much, unless they're my friends. I know them personally. So uh, mainstream YouTubers here would be uh, Baninai, um, uh, Benedict Hua, and you know those, that that crowd, <laughs> uh, uh, Agassi, um, um, oh, but internationally, like I'm subscribed to, who am I subscribed to? Uh, actually I'm subscribed to more like obscure channels. I like it. I like watching the, how people like, uh, evolve over time. But then like once they're, once they're up there, it's, it gets kind of, it's kind of boring, you know? <laughs> so I unsubscribe. <laughs> I gotta say, among your uh, act, Tagalog acting challenge videos, the Jai guy is my favorite. The Jai oh, guy yeah. is my favorite. Yeah, that was funny. And we shot that in uh, the thoughtful bubble. In the thought bubble. Yeah. So you want to you want to talk about that, yeah. Sir Richie? Yeah, sure. No, no. Well, just uh, for the for those that are looking uh, uh, for help with production, Thoughtful actually has a green screen studio that uh that you can shoot in as a member uh of uh the, the network but of course we gotta wait for the safety protocols and all of that so probably by hopefully in the next couple of months it's going to be up and running once again so direct thank you so much do you have any other parting words to your subscribers and uh, the people watching right now um well just if you guys have like any more questions uh, like any specific questions, then feel free to message me personally, like in any of the, uh, if any, in any of my social media accounts, like, like I'm always here to help. Um, you know, that's my niche is to <laughs> right now uh, that, that, by the way, that's also like how quarantine has helped me as well is to like really focus on a specific, uh, niche for my channel. Like, uh, like, um, it wasn't until now that I'm more focused on filmmaking type content. So, so yeah, just uh, feel free to message me if you have any more questions about uh, content yeah, creation. We hope to get to see you when things are better. Come over to the office. Let's have lunch with Mai. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. 
All right. So again, thank you, Direct Bani, for your uh, insights. I, it's really, really helpful. I, I, I learned a lot. I got inspired to do quite a few ideas running through my head right now that I uh, I feel it, it within the next uh, couple of months I can I can I can put to work. So thank you, Talaga. I'm sure everyone enjoyed. We got a lot of. Uh, Ano ito, the Yummy Yuppies, Direk. Want to do a Tagalog acting challenge? <laughs> sige, sige. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Sige, thank you, Direk. Guys, before we close, um, I just want to uh, close the uh, this uh, this webinar with, some, with a video that we made regarding the guidelines for shooting material uh, during this time of uh, COVID. So if you guys are making content or anything like that, there, uh, especially if, if it's related to uh, COVID, there are some guidelines that you need to follow. So just to make sure that you don't get a, a, a copyright strike, your, your channel deactivated or anything like that, we just uh, here are some guidelines that you need to follow. Maestro. The COVID-19 virus is the hot topic around the world right now. It has changed the way we work, interact with others, and how we live. Given the adjustments we need to make on our daily living, it's only natural for YouTubers to be interested in creating content based on COVID-19. Before you consider doing so, here are some guidelines of things you shouldn't do when making YouTube videos for COVID-19 and some things that you should take to heart. Don't show distressing footage. You never want to make content of someone else's pain. So using footage of people visibly suffering from the virus is not permitted, whether it's at home, at a hospital, or medical care facility. People in obvious distress, such as someone being forced out of their location, is also not acceptable. Do not put out medical misinformation. YouTube has become even more vigilant in its battle against fake news. Content that misinforms users about health matters related to COVID-19 is not monetizable. This includes content that encourages non-medical tests for exams for COVID-19 or false unproven claims about the cause, the promotion of dangerous remedies or cures, origin or spread of COVID-19 that contradicts scientific consensus and substantiated conspiracy theories. Do not do COVID-19 related pranks and challenges with people's lives on the line. Now is not the time to make light of the situation. Any COVID-19 related prank or challenge that promotes medically dangerous activities such as purposeful exposure to the virus are not acceptable for monetization. So does this mean that creators cannot monetize their COVID-19 centric content for YouTube? Absolutely not. If you're interested in making videos based on COVID-19, you just need to follow these guidelines. First and foremost, always adhere to YouTube's advertiser-friendly and community guidelines. The same standard for all types of content still applies to content revolving around COVID-19. Remember, this is an ongoing global crisis. A little sensitivity to other people's plight will go a long, long way. We ask that if you choose to share COVID-19 related content, you do so with the best intentions in mind. Try as much as possible to create content that is uplifting and authentic at the same time. And finally, fact check your work. Only share information that comes from reputable sources, such as the World Health Organization, the Department of Health, and your local government social media outlets to inform your content. The last thing you want to be accused of is spreading misinformation. Remember, in these times of uncertainty, it's content that is uplifting and authentic that will help people get through the struggles that they may face. As creators, let's hope we can make a difference in someone's life through the power of positive messaging through our content. Let your videos be impactful, be effective, and be thoughtful.